Hello, thank you for joining us for the July 13th, The Nutritionist webinar. Today we're joined well, by thanks Dr. For the Lance opportunity, Baumgard. Uh, to talk Lance about something is a I'm distinguished professor about, and normal and Jacobson professor of nutritional physiology in the Department of Animal Science at Iowa State University, where he researches milk, dairy fat cows, synthesis, metabolism, and energetics of the transition in heat stress cow and we'll immunometabolism. Lance they may and his die, colleagues actually, have recently stress, focused so their research efforts more on the energetic and mineral requirements uh, of an activated with. immune system. So in particular, he and his group are describing how immune activation alters nutrient stress trafficking economics, and ultimately right? reduces the negative farm consequences animal of productivity. On farm animal productivity. The original and presentation thus, is given twice uh, on the, the scheduled day potential with live questions and discussion from participants and co-hosts around the world. After the presentation, You'll be able to listen to the question and answer period. Uh, I've seen for estimates costing American agriculture between I have four and six billion well as dollars a year in the United States. It's about 1.7 just in the dairy industry alone. Well, thanks for the opportunity uh, to talk about something that I'm quite passionate about and have been for a long time, and that's uh, heat stress and why heat stress decreases farm animal productivity, in particular dairy cows. And in addition to why it reduces productivity, we'll talk a little bit about why they may die actually from heat stress. So this is unfortunately much more common than what people uh, are familiar with. So one of the keen reasons, of course, that we're interested in heat stress is economics, right? The negative consequences of heat stress on farm animal productivity and thus uh, the money-making potential of the operation is compromised in every segment of animal agriculture. And of course, dairy, the dairy industry is most sensitive. Uh, I've seen estimates costing American agriculture between four to six billion dollars a year. In the United States, it's about 1.7 just in the dairy industry alone. Globally, it's hard to uh, calculate, of course, but it's a it's a multi-billion-dollar issue. Now. So it's already a problem. I think everyone's familiar with that. It's going to become a bigger issue if climate change continues as most people predict, right? That's obvious, but maybe a more inconspicuous reason why heat stress is gonna cost us more in the future are, is because of genetic selection. All of the genetic phenotypes that we're interested in from an animal agriculture perspective, milk yield per cow, lean tissue accretion, eggs per chicken, piglets per sow, etc. Um, all of these things are associated with increased heat production. The more milk a cow produces, the more heat at which they, they produce. So now it becomes more of a physics issue. Um, the more heat an animal generates, the temperature at which they become stressed is going to continue to go down. And this is a huge issue. So obviously heat stress is already a, a massive burden on our global dairy industry. It's going to get worse because milk yield is going to continue to go up with genetic progress. I like this photo for a variety of reasons. Here you can see the cows that are bunching. This is obviously a freestyle free barn. They're bunching. Uh, she's got her tongue hanging out and you can see this drool. This drool is incredibly important for a rumen health perspective. And the uh, last place we want it is on the ground. But this contributes to some of this summer-induced rumen acidosis, which we'll talk about briefly. So we, we utilize only two variables when considering the THI, or the temperature humidity index. And that's just simply temperature and humidity. So that does not take into account solar radiation. So as a consequence of this, this THI calculation, or this metric is a good indicator of heat stress for animals that are under shade. Not so great uh, for grazing animals that are in the sun. But anyway, it's simply a combination of temperature and humidity. And for over 60 years, we've thought cows become heat stressed when the THI combination reaches 72. So you can see here uh, at 88 degrees and 0% humidity, that would be a THI of 72, or quite comfortable temperature of 72 degrees Fahrenheit, but 95% humidity would also be a THI of 72. 
Now this THI was calculated. This THI was calculated um, over 60 years ago at the University of Missouri when cows were making about 12 to 13 kilograms of milk per day. And of course, we know now that cows are producing 50 kilograms, 65, 75 kilograms of milk per day. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we know now that uh, the more milk a cow produces, the temperature at which it becomes heat stress will continue to go down. And that's exactly what's going on. I don't have time to talk about our experiments we did at the University of Arizona with um, Rob Rhodes and Matt Bambala and Bob Callier, but we put cows into a variety of different types of THI situations and discovered that milk yield starts to decrease at a THI of about 67 on modern cows. So a THI of 67 actually could be quite cool. Um, you and I may want to put on a jacket, but that's when modern dairy cows start to become heat stressed from a milk yield perspective. Okay, And of course, this is going to continue to go down as milk yield continues to increase. And of course, this is a global problem. I lived in Arizona for 10 years. Um, and you know we always think of heat stress as a Florida, Texas, Arizona problem, uh, at least in the United States, that's what we think of. But in reality, uh, almost every dairy producing geography of the globe experiences moderate to severe heat stress throughout the, the season. Even uh, Canada, over almost 50% of the Canadian summer days have a THI of greater than 72. So clearly, if the half the summer is stressful in Canada, a vast majority of the, of the summer in America and South America and southern parts of Europe are going to be stressful. So uh, we, we know that heat stress decreases productivity and the dairy farmer can see that right away in the, in the milk tank. But there's other things that cost the producer money. Reduced body condition, acute health problems, primarily we're talking about mastitis here. Rumen acidosis is a hidden cost um, for a variety of reasons dairy cows become rumen acidotic during heat stress. We'll talk about that just briefly. Uh, pregnancy rates, right? Uh, it's very common for preg rates in upper Midwest to run 25, 30% in January and run 15 to 10% at the end of July. And of course, this um, infertility is a huge contribution to the economics of heat stress. They can die, especially that very early um, embryo, the first 10 days after conception, is very sensitive to the mother's body temperature. Lameness, every dairy farmer I've talked to around the globe complains about their cows having sore feet at the end of the summer and early fall. Well, this is in part because they stand when they become heat stressed. And this uh, room, or this heat stress induced rumen acidosis can also contribute to lameness and they can die. That's something I want to highlight today, emphasize more than I normally do when I give these types of talks, is this mortality induced or caused by heat stress is a huge problem uh, economically for the dairy producer, obviously, but it's also a huge issue from a, um, from a welfare perspective and what the general public perceives of our industry. So, mortality. Many of you may probably remember the 2006 California heat wave that killed about 45,000 dairy cows, uh, killed over a million turkeys. Just a couple summers ago, we had a heat stress in, in the Midwest and over 10,000 head of beef cattle died in Kansas. It's not just farm animals, right? In 2003, uh, a European heat wave hit Europe and over 70,000 people in France alone died from heat, from, from heat exhaustion or, or heat heat stroke. And just recently, a 2022 European heat wave, over 20,000 people died. Heat can kill. And it's very important that we are familiar with how and why it can kill. And this is just some gory pictures I have of, of dead cattle in Kansas on the right. And this is an Argentina heat wave uh, a few years ago that killed millions of layers. And um, Oh, I'm sorry, you can't see this picture. This is also just a recent picture of dead, of dead cattle. Well, well a, a colleague of mine, a collaborator of mine in uh, Italy, Ambruto Brunibucci, uh, looked at thousands of, of mortality records and uh, graphed them, adjusted uh, on the y-axis versus the minimum THI of the day. 
And what you can see really nicely is when the THI, when the minimum THI of the day does not get below 70, you have a rapid increase in mortality. Um, and it's, it's quite evident, right? You can see the increase starting in probably the early to low 60s, but once that THI minimum reaches uh, 70, you have a rapid and uh, dangerous escalation in, in mortality. So that was mortality. This is conception rates. And I'm just really putting this on here because everyone's familiar with how hot it becomes in South Africa, Florida, and Arizona. But even very temperate climates like Minnesota, you see a decrease in, in preg rates uh, every year, right? So it's not just milk. It's not just health. Fertility is a huge con uh, contribution to the negative consequences of, of heat stress on to the dairy farm by so very quickly on, on heat stress induced rumen acidosis, this cow is a great example of what's going on here. She's open mouth panting, her tongue is hanging out, and she's drooling. And this panting contributes to rumen acidosis because he's, she's essentially hyperventilating and the amount of CO2 leaving her uh, system is increased. She needs to keep a very uh, tight homeostatic control of CO2 in her blood, and she does that by balancing, or balancing that with bicarbonate. So when she's hyperventilating, she dumps bicarbonate into the urine, and as a consequence, there's less bicarbonate in blood that ends, on, ends up in, in saliva. And this also then contributes to the saliva not having as much bicarbonate our buffering capacity. And you see here, she's drooling. In other words, the saliva is not going down into the room and it's falling on the ground. And this is very old uh, uh, paper now, but still a very good one. And it just looks at rumen pH on the y-axis. Cows eating a high forage diet or a high concentrate diet. It doesn't matter what type of diet they're eating. When they're, when they're heat stress, rumen pH goes down. And so I think this is a huge issue. It's kind of a, a quiet, um, inconspicuous cause of reduced farm uh, income, because obviously reduced rumen pH is, uh, negatively affects digestion and it has a negative impact on health. Okay, so normal metabolism review, an animal that's in thermal neutral conditions, that's eating as much as it wants, the primary uh, endocrine reflections would be an increase in insulin and a decrease in non-esterified fatty acids and a decrease in catabolic hormones like cortisol and epinephrine. An animal that's suboptimal feed intake or malnourished should have a reduction in insulin. It's this hypoinsulinemia that allows her to mobilize adipose tissue. And of course, the catabolic hormones go up glucagon, epinephrine, and, and growth hormone. So really there's only one potent anabolic hormone and it's counterbalanced by a variety of different catabolic hormones. This is a normal metabolism. Okay, so one of the questions we had uh, when we first started researching heat stress was how much of the decrease in milk yield is caused by the reduction in feed intake? So really what we're asking is, what are the direct effects of heat versus the indirect? And of course, the indirect effects of heat are mediated by this reduction in feed intake. So we did these experiments. It's called a pair feeding design. I'll explain what that means. So we heat stress a group of cows in chambers so we can control all aspects of the environment. And there's a decrease in feed intake. There's, these cows are in red. Our controls are in thermal neutral conditions, 18 degrees centigrade. Um, but we measure the decrease in feed intake that the cows that are heat stressed have, and we implement that same level of feed restriction to the thermal neutral cows, okay? So now we have two groups of cows, one's heat stressed, one is not, the pair fed thermal neutral controls, but they're both eating the same quantities of feed. Okay, so now we can, this allows us to separate out the direct effects of heat versus the, the, the effects of heat that are caused by insufficient feed intake. So here we have milk yield on the y-axis. And of course, the pear-fed cows, because they have a 30% reduction in feed intake, they also have a reduction in milk yield of about 12 to 15 pounds, 5 to 6 kilograms. 
Okay, but right away the heat, the thermal neutral cow will adapt her metabolism to support milk yield. The heat stress cow can't. She's losing uh, milk yield progressively for about the first seven days, and she plateaus out here. So now we know that all the area, the difference between this blue line and this red line, has nothing to do with reduced feed intake. It has everything to do with just simply being hot. So by doing some simple arithmetic, we know that 50% of the reduction of milk yield is because of a reduction in feed intake, and 50% of it is due to the simply the direct effects of being hot. So I've spent the last 15 years chasing down this other 50%. So both the pear-fed cows now in yellow, and the heat stress cows will lose almost 50 kilograms of body weight in those seven to nine days. Okay, so this is a substantially catabolic uh, event, a massive loss of body weight. And of course, the pear fed cows in thermoneutral conditions, remember, they're in yellow, and they're in thermoneutral conditions, they're going off feed, but they're still trying to make milk, and the way they still try to make milk is they milk it off their back non esterified fatty acids increase, just like you'd predict, but the heat stress cows do not. They simply do not mobilize adipose tissue during heat stress. And this is a highly conserved response amongst pigs, rodents, even humans. When they become heat stressed, they simply do not mobilize adipose tissue as you would anticipate, despite the fact that they've lost a lot of body weight. Why? Well, it's probably because of an increase in insulin. Despite the fact that there's a decrease in feed intake, basal levels of insulin actually goes up during heat stress. And again, this happens not only in dairy cows, it happens in beef cattle, pigs, rodents, rabbits, even snakes. Even a non-mammalian species, when they become heat stressed, there's an increase in circulating insulin and um, insulin response to glucose tolerance test. So this is really unusual because, right, remember I've already kind of highlighted the fact that insulin is an anabolic hormone. It's responsive to increases in feed intake. Why on earth would heat stress cause insulin to go up? It's, um, it's really strange. I'll come back to this in a minute. So the nice thing about dairy cows is you can do an accounting of glucose. If you can measure lactose, which of course we can, uh, we can determine that the heat stress cow is secreting about 400 grams less milk sugar per day than the pear fed thermoneutral controls. So the question we had then was maybe the liver is not making enough glucose, of course, because in a ruminant animal, all the glucose is coming from the, from the liver. So that's what, that's what our next experiment we wanted to do, is test the, the idea that maybe it's the liver's fault. Well, it turns out that it's not. And I don't want to bore you with all the biochemical uh, details of this experiment, but we measured rates of hepatic glucose production using stable, stable isotopes. And what you can clearly see here is in the pear-fed and the heat-stressed cows, there's a reduction, but the reduction is the same between the two. In other words, um, it's not the liver's fault. The liver is making the glucose. Some other tissue or system, maybe the immune system, is utilizing this excess glucose, and the mammary gland is simply not getting its fair share. So, here's what we anticipate would happen during heat stress: there'd be an increase in catabolic hormones, a decrease in insulin, an increase in adipose tissue lipolysis, etc. But what actually happens is, yes, there is an increase in catabolic hormones, but there's an increase in insulin. Strange, but this increase in insulin prevents adipose tissue mobilization and thus reduces fatty acid oxidation and increases whole body glucose oxidation. This is a really weird and bizarre metabolic profile during heat stress and we'll try to show you why cows and other animals do this when they become heat stress. But eventually, heat stress ultimately heat stress prevents glucose sparing that the thermal neutral now nourish animal can, can utilize the prioritize uh, milk and uh, muscle synthesis. So what's explaining this other 50%? I hope you're begging me to tell you why. Well, let's get into it. Let's go into the pathophysiology of heat stress. But first you need to understand the GI tract. 
the gastrointestinal tract, or GIT. The GI tract is a tube running from the animal's mouth to its anus. And everything inside that tube technically, technically remains outside of the body. <coughs> Normally, the GI tract's job is to digest and absorb valuable nutrients, and clearly that's important. But there's millions and probably trillions and multiple trillions, hundreds of trillions of things, molecules, parasites, enzymes, acids, toxins, etc., that are inside the GI tract that the GI tract has to prevent from getting inside the animal's body. It has to keep it inside the lumen of the GI tract. So it has this barrier function that's incredibly important. So uh, to give you an idea of how big the GI tract is, let's, let's focus only on the human GI tract surface area for a second. The skin is an epithelium. It's about two meters squared. The lungs is also an epithelium. The GI tract, because of these adaptations the animal utilizes to increase the surface area of itself, is massive. The surface area of a human's GI tract is 150 times that the size of the surface of the skin. If you laid the GI tract down and spread it out the surface area, it would be about the size of a double tennis court. Now what happens is that the GI tract has these mucosal folds, it has the villi and it has the microvilli. These are all adapta uh, adaptions, adaptations, excuse me. The animal utilizes this the increase the surface area of the gut. Okay. And this is enormous, right? And that, obviously I'm talking about a monogastric here because we're talking about humans. So just imagine how big the ruminant's surface area of its GI tract is. It might be the size of five to ten soccer fields. It's huge. It's absolutely massive. And there are trillions and trillions of microbes that are, in, that are living inside the GI tract that want to get in. They want to infiltrate through the barrier of the epithelium. And if they do, even if they're commensal, they're going to stimulate an immune response. So what happens when the animal gets heat stressed? Well, there's a diversion of blood. And every single person who's listening to this outstanding webinar um, is familiar with that. Right? You go to the beach, you go to the gym, you bale hay, you work cattle, you pick rock, you walk beans. It doesn't matter what you do. Uh, if you are out and you get hot, there's a distribution of blood to the periphery. In other words, there's an increase in blood flow to the skin. That's why your skin gets red. And to support that increased blood flow to the skin, there has to be vasoconstriction somewhere else. If there wasn't vasoconstriction somewhere else, the animal would die from low blood pressure. Well, the area of the body that vasoconstricts during heat stress is the gut. Blood flow to the gut will markedly be decreased up to 50 to 75 percent. The problem is the gut is very sensitive to hypoxia or very low levels of oxygen being delivered by this reduced blood flow. So here we have the ileum of a thermoneutral animal. This is the villi um, of a thermoneutral, well-fed a libidum fed animal, the villi are long and are thick. They're like thick, chunky fingers. Now the heat stress damage is obvious. You can't even really identify some of these through uh, uh, the villi. Now off feed events, just simply going off feed and pair feeding in thermal neutral conditions also damages the gut. But really we want to talk about heat stress today. And so, you know, what I want you to focus on here is just that the, the physical damage to the epithelial barrier of the gut intestine is, is is obvious during heat stress. So what's the problem with that? Well, there are gazillions of unwanted molecules in your gut. One of them that we study in the lab and you probably read about often is lipopolysaccharide. It's a component of gram-negative bacteria. Now, if LPS is able to get through a barrier, whether it's your nose or your mouth or your uterus or whatever, it's going to stimulate an immune response and cause the classic sick phenotype that we're all familiar with. Reduced appetite, fever, you get tired and lazy, etc. So here is just a quick example, uh, oversimplified cartoon of two enterocytes that are lying in the villi and this yellow um, cartoon here is supposed to represent LPS, are actually entire um, microbes, but the two enterocytes are connected by these what's called tight junction proteins. There's at least 30 to 40 of them that we now know about that are made inside the cell but embedded in the lateral portion of the membrane. 
and they reach out and make a physical connection with their neighbor's tight junction proteins. And this creates a physical barrier now, kind of like a zipper in a coat or Velcro on a shoe. And this prevents then unwanted molecules from getting in. But for some unknown reasons that we're still trying to figure out, it turns out that heat stress and a variety of stressors do the same thing, by the way. The stressors cause these tight junction proteins to be pulled back in. And now with this, this, this takes away the physical barrier and allows unwanted molecules like antigens and entire microbes to get in. And they stimulate an immune response. And if, they, if the local immune system is overwhelmed, well, now this antigen is going to travel to the liver via the portal blood. And if the liver gets overwhelmed, it goes, it's going to go systemic and the animal starts experiencing what's called sepsis or septic shock. And even bacteriemia, by the way. And this happens very rapidly. Uh, uh, this is time of heat stress on the x-axis, plasma, LPS on the right y-axis. And you can see the increase in circulating um, LPS occurs within the first two hours of heat stress. LPS binding protein goes down because LPS binding protein is binding LPS, so the concentrations of the free LBP go down. Long story short is that both the changes in LBP and endotoxin or LPS both agree that the effects on the heat stress on the gut occur very, very rapidly. Okay. So now we have a leaky gut, we have antigens coming in, we have these antigens being recognized by the immune system, mostly the um, innate immune system. And what happens during heat stress then is you have a, a cortisol response, as the name implies, it's stress, right? And, and cortisol is the classic stress hormone that we all like to measure because it's cheap and easy. It's not a great marker of stress, to be quite honest with you, but that's for a different day. Um, and because of this increasing levels of LPS, you have an increase in what is called acute phase proteins are kind of markers of inflammation, LPS binding protein and serum amyloid A. Now, the acutely, the LPS binding protein goes down, but these are days of heat stress, and you can see an increase in both of them, twofold and fourfold. So the summary up to this point is that uh, Reduced feed intake only explains about 50% of the reduction in milk yield. There's a strange hyperinsulinemia. That's weird. Uh, it's not the liver's fault. There's a leaky gut. We can't find 400 grams of glucose, which we'll come back to in a minute. And eventually, though, at the end of the day, um, heat stress is an immune activation event. And in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, it's really not any much different than mastitis or metritis or pneumonia. So the, so the gut becomes leaky, why should we care? Well, let's talk now about the immune system because once the immune system gets activated, it's going to steal nutrients away from the mammary gland and cost your producers money. Just a very quick reminder, the nutritionist balances the ration to safely maximize propionate production. Propionate is a three carbon volatile fatty acid that's converted in the liver to glucose. The six carbon sugar is the precursor to lactose, which is a disaccharide made in the mammary gland. Why is this pathway important? Because lactose synthesis drives milk yield. In other words, the more lactose the mammary gland makes, the more overall milk yield there will be. And of course, the producer takes us to the bank. And it takes about 72 grams of glucose, 72 grams of glucose to make one kilogram of milk. Okay. So, Turns out many stressors increase insulin, not just heat stress, but again, why? What is the intent of an animal that is potentially about to die from heat stress? Why would it have an increase in circulating insulin? And it, this is just a figure from a friend of mine, Matt Waldron, showing that if he, he induces uh, mastitis, he tricks the the, the cow into thinking she's got mastitis by infusing LPS into the mammary gland up the teat canal. Two hours later, uh, despite the fact the cow has completely stopped eating, has a massive fever, floppy ears, looks horrible, eyes are sunken in, it's a very obviously sick cow. Two hours later, insulin goes up. Why does this happen? Well, let's talk about why. 
We need to give homage to a guy named Otto Warburg. Otto Warburg was a biochemist back in the 30s, actually 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s. But he wins the 1930. Uh, one Nobel Prize for discovering that cancer cells, once they become cancerous, only want to burn glucose. But he also discovers that immune cells, like neutrophils, macrophages, lymphocytes, only want to burn glucose once they've been activated, activated by an antigen. Now, incidentally, Otto Warburg was a PhD advisor for a young student named Hans Krebs. And, uh, you know, remember the Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle? And he was a family friend of Albert Einstein. So, um, the Warburg effect essentially shows this. Here we have a resting immune cell. Think of it as a macrophage or a neutrophil. It could burn glucose, but you could also burn other fuels like uh, amino acids or fatty acids or acetate or whatever. Right? But this brings uh, glucose down through glycolysis, brings it into the Krebs cycle, Hans Krebs, and it generates an inefficient large quantity of ATP. Just notice this is kind of slow lumbering process. Now the immune cell gets activated by insulin, right? Binds to a CLR4 receptor. It does not bring glucose down into the TCA cycle. It only generates ATP via glycolysis. And then most of the carbon is kicked out as lactic acid. This is why blood pH goes down in a sick animal or an infected animal. So the question we had was how much? How much glucose is the, is the immune system using? Well, that's quite difficult to determine because the immune system's everywhere, right? And, and, and it migrates. So it's very difficult to um, isolate the immune system to determine how much fuel it is using. Because remember, glucose is the precursor to lactose. So, and we now know that because of Hans or uh, Otto Warburg, that the immune system only wants to burn glucose. So we utilized and developed a, a technique that I think is quite um, creative. Uh, I'm a little bit biased, but it is what we call it an LPS euglycemic clamp. And it's uh, we give it the animal LPS, we cause it to be sick. There's some my, there's a, about 90 minutes of hyperglycemia, and then the animal becomes hypoglycemic because the hypoglycemia is being caused by the immune system's massive utilization of glucose. So our, our thought process was, well, could we just simply prevent the hypoglycemia and use this as a proxy of determining or cal calculating the immune system's glucose use? So uh, we, we've done this multiple times in multiple models. It's actually quite a simple experiment. We have the pump. Above the pump, you have a, a bottle of glucose. The, animal, the student <laughs> The student uh, gives LPS. And then on the other uh, jugular vein is connected to the pump. And we know what the glucose concentration should be. We adjust the glucose um, infusion rates on this pump. And we can then determine how much glucose is being os ostensibly used by the immune system. Very simple experiment, actually. Um, and if you subtract off the positive and negative controls, you do this for 12 hours, um, it's over a kilo. A kilogram of glucose is necessary to maintain euglycemia. And if you extrapolate that to a day, that's two kilos, right? Well, this is what 1.8 kilograms looks like of pure sugar. So this is an enormous cost, energetic cost of a very specific fuel not just the energy in general, it's a very specific fuel. 8.4 megacals of sugar is necessary just for the dairy cow to mount an extreme and admittedly an intense immune response. And we've, like I said, we've done this in steers, pigs, and multiple times in cows. And when we compare apples to apples, so in other words, we put their body weight on a metabolic body weight, then this number is always about one gram of glucose per kilogram of metabolic body weight per hour. And these numbers are highly consistent. So it makes me believe that we're chasing something that's real. And to put this in perspective, if we have a dairy cow, a hog, and a steer, and let's just say the, the immune system is intensely activated in all three of these species. So it uses 2,000 kilograms of glucose, 960 grams of glucose, and 1,500. What would be the 
phenotypic consequence. Well, 28 liters of milk or 28 kilograms of milk, 1.4 kilograms of lean tissue, and 2.1 kilograms of muscle synthesis in the steer. So this is a big deal. Remember, we couldn't find that sugar during those heat chest experiments I talked about earlier? Well, no wonder we couldn't find it. The liver was making it. The muscle wasn't using it. The mammary gland wasn't using it. It was being used by the immune system. That's why we had a hard time um, figuring out where it was going. So uh, a very good friend of mine and colleague, uh, Dr. Buzz Burhans and I and his wife uh, wrote a, uh, she's actually the smart one of the three, um, wrote, I think, a very nice paper on the pathophysiology of heat stress in dairy cows. And if you're interested in it, it's a 2021 Journal of Dairy Science Review. But long story short, the same thing happens. The gut becomes leaky. You end up getting endotoxemia. This endotoxemia causes hypercoagulation, or sometimes it's called disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC for short, and oftentimes joked around about it's not DIC, it's really death is coming. Because once this process starts where you get hypercoagulation everywhere, the animal dies. It's on it's on the highway to death. So heat stress pathophysiology summary is that heat stress causes hyperpermeability of the gut. This causes uh, immune activation and an inflame, inflammatory storm, and which then causes the DIC. Activation uh, Immune activation induced hyperinsulinemia, hypoglycemia, and hyperlactemia, which is causing the metabolic acidosis. Ultimately, this is, um, my camera's in the way here, but this causes morbidity and mortality. So let's call it, just do a summary. We have a ruminant animal on the left where you're feeding it to create propionate to make, for the liver to make glucose, or the monogastric on the right, okay? so. In a healthy animal or unstressed animal, the glucose and amino acids are utilized for the synthesis of um, productive processes. Now the animal gets stressed for some whatever reason, it's heat, for example, in this particular seminar, it's heat, which causes an immune activation. Now we have an increase in insulin. Now instead of these nutrients being shunted towards economically important phenotypes, they're governed or they're trafficked toward the immune system. Why? Because the immune system is more important than her making milk. And uh, production goes down. So the successful transition cow, I like to compare the heat stress cow to the successful transition cow, where she um, creates propionate in the rumen, which is made in the liver to glucose. Now, the successful transition cow has very low levels of insulin. This allows her to mobilize adipose tissue. That's why non-certified fatty acids are increased. The nephus can be utilized for energy by most of the carcass. There are a few cell types that cannot utilize nephus, and primarily I'm talking about the central nervous system. No problem. These nephus then will be converted in the liver to ketones, which the central nervous system can use for energy. Now, the entire carcass can utilize either nephus, ketones, or acetate for energy. Okay, this allows up to 95% of the glucose being made by the liver to be taken up by the mammary gland and to be converted into milk. This is normal. This is not something we should be worried about. This certainly is not pathological. High nephes and high ketones do not cause problems. Okay, now the heat stress cow is getting LPS from some segment of the gut. I have it here shown the rumen, but it could be the small or large intestine. This causes the pancreas to make more insulin than what it should. This shuts down NEPA mobilization. And now LPS stimulates the immune system, which only wants to burn glucose. We know nothing shuts down feed intake quicker than uh, being sick, so the immune activation shuts down feed intake. And the hyperinsulinemia then also then helps facilitate the immune systems, their leukocytes, glucose uptake. And the LPS causes the uh, growing follicle to be compromised and it compromises the vitality of the early embryo. And it can cause abortions. 
So I think leaky gut actually explains a variety of problems in animal agriculture, not just heat stress, which we talked about for most of this talk. Inadequate feed intake, off-feed events, transition period. I think this is a huge issue with regards to poorly transitioning dairy cows. Weaning is a classic example of a stress-induced leaky gut. Shipping, overcrowding, unpowered of feed. Essentially, any type of psychological stress can cause leaky gut, uh, which I didn't have a lot of time to go in and talk about this. So, heat stress decreases almost every single metric of productivity on the dairy farm and it doesn't matter if you are a large farmer or a small farmer everyone in our industry is negatively affected by heat stress the reduction in feed intake is only a small portion of the problem there are direct effects of heat and primarily there we're talking about its effects on the gut the gut becomes hyperpermeable or leaky this allows antigens to to leak in, which stimulates the immune system. The immune system now has a larger priority than making milk, muscle, or eggs, or whatever. And it has an enormous appetite for two things, glucose and amino acids. And those are, of course, the, the building blocks for the synthesis of not only milk, but also muscle and eggs and anything that's important to a farmer. I didn't have a chance to talk about it yet, but the primary strategy with regards to um, preventing the negative consequences of heat stress is physically modifying the environment. Heat stress abatement strategy, shade, water, fans, evaporative cooling, etc. So I hope this seminar provided some value to you on why cows become heat stress. Um, I could give four or five different types of one hour, 45 minute light hour or 45 minute lectures on different aspects of heat, rumen acidosis, management strategies, nutritional strategies, etc. But this is the, the, the foundation of why heat stress cows have a reduction in milk yield, why heat stress cows may sometimes die. Um, and I have a lot of people to thank before I get too far, but the United States Department of Agriculture and multiple uh, industry partners um, that I'm proud to collaborate with. These are my students. They do all the work. I just sit in the office, my air conditioned office and, and uh, look at data. Thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to the answer and question sec uh, session and I hope your clients have a great summer. That completes the recorded presentation. Before proceeding to the question and discussions, I will remind you of the speaker for the next webinar on August 10th. We are very pleased to host Dr. Jeff Dahl, who will discuss the effects of prepartum heat stress on the calf and its future productivity. For the convenience of the global audio the webinars, we offer the recorded webinars twice on webinar day and record the question and answer session for each. For this reason, you may observe repetition in the questions. Additionally, we take the recording once posted and convert it into a podcast so that you can listen to them as you're driving. This is a question from Mohammed's help in fighting heat stress. I'm very interested in polyphenols um, from in its anti-inflammatory effects stemming from the intestine, large and small intestine in particular. And so I, 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 I'm not familiar with people who have looked at that uh, on a specific controlled and intervening experimentation, but I can envision, I can totally envision where if you could curb some of that intestinal derived inflammation that, that you would probably have some type of benefit there. So, um, you know, I, I think the hypothesis for why and how it works would, could be um, could be easily envisioned. I just don't know data, strong data to support it. Okay. Uh, th thanks very much. Um, and I, again, apologize for all the, the issues I seem to be having today. Um, I was going to ask, um, let's see, I see that Marcelo has left us. He probably had something he needed to go to. I'll ask a couple more questions in Q&A. Yep. Um, Lance, in even in a strict, this is from Ron Solomon, yeah. um, strict cooling management like we have here, and I think Ron is um, 
yeah, there's always one to two hours intervals during the day of resting when heat stress starts. What's the minimal gap during until the next cooling when LPS and other bad symptoms begin? That's a great question. And I tell you, um, I think I showed that one graph where circulating LPS starts to increase within two hours of being heat stressed. So, Do you remember what page or what uh, slide? Right there, 33. This one? 33. 33. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in this particular graph, you can see the increase in circulating uh, LPS uh, occurs within two hours. Now, um, I should have, if I, I can't remember if I told you this or not, but this is in a pig model. Pigs get hot a lot quicker than cows do because of their surface area to mass ratio. They, they cool down a lot quicker than cows do too. So, uh, Ron, I, I, know, I, I know you guys' intensive cooling um, system where you're running cows in these cooling cooling sheds, cooling pens. Um, and I'm just I'm very impressed how, how good you guys cool cows. But I think, you know, even, up, <clears throat> even within a couple hours, now, like I said, cows don't get as hot as quickly as a pig does, but they also don't cool off as quickly either. Um, so, you know, what that, what that time length is, I, I don't know. Um, if you, you know, I'm sure you, you guys probably have some rectal temperature data, you know, 102.5 Fahrenheit, and I apologize for not knowing what that is in Celsius, 39 and a half or something. You know, is when early embryos start to die. So, yeah, I don't have a good answer for you, Ron. Thanks for listening, though. Sounds like good research. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, one one more question here from our question windows, and then I'll um, I'll ask Tom or Marty, and I'm I'm suspicious that Tom may be involved in something else, but. Um, Here's a question on nutrition. In South and East Europe, we often see, and this is from Jan Baker, um, we often see rations very high in bypass starch as opposed to Northwest Europe. What are your thoughts on the impact of high levels of bypass starch on heat stressed animals? I think that's a great question, Jan. Um, I think it's dangerous potentially dangerous, especially if the small intestine is unable to enzymatically digest that arriving starch. Um, I think the large intestine is already prone to hyperpermeability because of the biology we discussed in today's seminar. Now, if you have uh, excessive starch digestion and you have hindgut uh, acidosis, hindgut increased osmolarity or osmo osmotic stress, I think you compound the problem. Is you know, again, this is just more theoretical because I've not seen any done, I've not done any research, I've not seen any type of research with this, but um we have done hindgut acidosis research in my lab now for about five or six years. Um it's a hit or miss when it comes to controlled interventions, but I, I think in general, starch digestion in the large intestine is one, it's economically unfavorable, right? You're, it's, a, it's a waste of money. And two, it's potentially dangerous. It's potentially immune activating event, especially during heat stress when the hind gut's probably already prone to some type of leakiness. And um... Uh, with wait, wait, let me jump in there. Okay. Uh, I just, I'm looking at the question with glucose too. So maybe those two okay. can be wrapped in together. Uh, I wanted they to jump in. I, hi, Lance. I wanted to jump in there too, in that you have to remember folks, bypass starch means that it was ruminally indigestible, which means it's typically more, you know, we're talking corns in this, typically in this case, which is more vitreous which is a harder corn, it actually causes more intestinal damage by itself. 
So everything that Lance is talking about in term or in terms of, of damage to the the villi and the small intestine, let's just let's just go there. Now we're making it, you know, we're we're basically feeding sandpaper uh, with with some of these really bad aggressive corns. Uh, so it's a completely dangerous thing to do, and this whole concept of bypass starch is just always been baffling to me because it doesn't make sense. I'll stop now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you were more uh, blunt in my response, but I, I, I tend to agree with you, especially if it gets past the small intestine. I think you're top 100% correct. Yeah. Sand, sandpaper is a wincer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, how about bypass past glucose in heat stress? Well, I think that's... Um, We've, my group has done some bypass glucose work on the transition cow, and I think there's a lot of similarities between the transition cow and the heat stress cow, the biology at least. Um, so I think there's an opportunity there for a bypass glucose to provide some benefit. Because, um, you know, clearly glucose is a big part of the story, right? And the immune system's using so much of it. So... I'm racking my brain to think of someone who's looked at that or actually done that controlled and intervening experimentation. I have i can't think of it off the top of my head. I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but the companies manufacturing these bypass glucose products, that would be a great investment of their time and money and they should do it at Iowa State University. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask, um, we'll come back to more of those questions. There's some good stuff in the um, Q and A. Marty, um, I know you need to leave. So did you have some questions? Uh, yes, good morning, Marianne. Good morning, Lance. Hey, Marty, I heard it's really hot in Northern Mexico. Is that true? <laughs> uh, it is, and actually, <laughs> um, I, I'll just tell you, I'm looking at a farm right now and, and we kind of got started on this conversation a couple of weeks ago in Ottawa, but we didn't get it completed. Um, we've had the last two days uh, on this particular farm at a THI um, kind of uh, average during the whole day of 78 plus. Um, so it's been quite hot, it's been quite mm -hmm. hot. Um, you spent some time towards the end of the talk, and maybe I missed because um, I was taking care of some other things about glucose and the effect on, on uh, uh, reducing milk volume uh, being supplied to the to the udder. And mm -hmm. I saw amino acids in that slide, but mm -hmm. there wasn't much discussion about milk protein. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I, I um, expressed to you that I was having um, seeing in a couple of different farms a decrease in milk protein <clears throat> as heat stress seemed to be going up. Um, made some changes to the to the diet, including a methionine analog, mm -hmm. and it appeared that we we're making some progress um, with milk protein coming back up. And then all of a sudden, another heat wave comes in, and and it's just plummeted. Um, do you think uh, heat stress or or an, an immune response of due to the heat stress could could be responsible for some sort of uh, decrease in protein content of milk? Yeah, I remember talking about this with you in Otto over a couple of beers. Yeah. And yeah. you had indicated that it wasn't just the normal seasonal decrease in milk protein that's observed. This was specific to a heat wave, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. the time that um, I, when we talked a couple of weeks ago, we, we also experienced some periods of heat stress of THI of 78, 77. And that's when the, when the protein came down and then it got cooler. Um, heat, uh, heat index of 75, 74s, and it was coming back up. And then bang, again, we're getting 77, 78s. Yeah. Well, um, I think the immune system could very likely be the explanation. I, I myself have not done work with the immune system's amino acid requirement, but there is a, um, a faculty member at UC Davis, his name is Kurt Clasing, and he's done a, a, a fantastic job of characterizing the amino acid requirement of an activated immune system. Now he uses the chicken as a model, but the immune system is so highly conserved that I, I would be shocked 
if the if it can't be translated and extrapolated to cattle and uh, it's it's substantial so just like the glucose requirement there is a very large amino acid requirement of a proliferating immune cell and um i don't think i've seen or maybe i certainly haven't done it maybe i should try to scale up what that would mean to a dairy cow um but right so when the immune system gets activated her priority is no longer synthesis of milk and those glucose and amino acids get partitioned to now the higher priority which is the immune system so i think i don't have good an answer for you marty but i would be very surprised if this wasn't a an immune system mediated phenomenon sure um maybe some of it has to do with with how the cow is responding as far as um uh open mouth breathing and and all that kind of stuff which i'm sure hurts some of the degradation of that's going on in the room and which may affect availability yeah. of milk for milk production as well so I'm, I'm sure it's not only an immune response but there's probably a combination of things yeah and she's open mouth planting she's obviously in a bad way and there's probably less microbial protein being made exactly exactly yeah. um curious though that the the milk urea nitrogen doesn't hasn't changed that much um at least in this particular herd that i'm looking at yeah so, yeah that is interesting hard to explain um it's just quite noticeable that when we're getting quite high this that all of a sudden the, the milk protein decides to take a turn for the for the worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in our controlled experiments at the university, we almost always, when milk protein goes down, we see a milk uh, urea nitrogen go up. It's pretty highly correlated. So it's strange that you're not seeing that. Yeah. And as far as I know, there haven't been any other changes in the diet or changes in forages or anything like that. So. Mm -hmm. No. Sorry for not being much help. No, that's okay. You, you kind of gave me a little bit of information to go on and and how to how to make changes the next the next visit later on today or tomorrow morning. Well, good luck with your client. Thanks. Thanks for joining, Marty. Okay. Adios, Marty. Adios. <laughs> Hasta um, la próxima. Hasta Diego. All right. Um, a question from Chad Jenkins. Has your group looked at organic osmolites like beta in um, for heat stress mitigation, ICE, ICE products, et cetera? Yeah. Any opinion on those? Betaine. Betaine, uh, sorry. <laughs> you're okay. You're fine. Um, we have. When, when I was at the University of Arizona, I collaborated with Bob Callier and Frank Dunche, actually, from Australia. We did some betaine work and um, not from a methyl donor perspective. So our dose was smaller because we were trying to target the um, uh, osmolite effects of betaine in the gut. And we saw some nice responses. And there's quite a bit of literature, especially from Africa, South Africa and Australia and Asia looking at betaine. Now, um, in the 1980s, from what I understand, I was too young to remember, but uh, North America looked at betaine quite hard. Uh, but from, from what I understand, if the diet is adequate in methionine, the effects of betaine aren't as impressive. So um, long story short, Chad, uh, we've, yeah, I think there's opportunities for betaine to be effective and products like ice. Um, if, not from a methyl donor perspective, but more for from a from a gut gut health perspective, and essentially keeping the epithelial cells from shrinking due to um, osmotic stress. 
All right, thank love, you. I would love to do some research with with betaine in uh in heat stress dairy cattle in a in a Midwest dairy ration. <laughs> so so more opportunities for research out there. Yes, yes, yes. at <laughs> Iowa State University. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. This is from an attendee in South Africa. Um, first of all, thank you for the nice talk and nicely elucidating the effects of heat stress. It's based in South Africa and they have quite a few pasture based dairies there. Question is, have you seen more pronounced effect of heat stress in TMR dairies with high production and better cooling during the days versus pasture dairies where production is generally lower and cows are exposed to the elements for longer stretches of the day, especially in Africa where summers can be quite hot? Yes, I've been to South Africa a few times. Beautiful place. Um, so you have you have you have conflicting scenarios here. Yeah. Let's just let's just start with the the pasture based cow is in the sun, right? So you can throw THI out the window because the THI is made for animals that are under a shade, um, and the solar radiation is can be incredibly powerful. So they're uh, experiencing certainly more of a, a higher heat load than the the animal that's being intensely cooled. However, uh, like the the person writing the question uh, wrote, the the high producing cow also generates a lot more heat than the low producing cow. That's why the modern dairy cow is a lot more sensitive to heat stress than the cow that's producing less milk. So I, I, again, here's another question that I don't have a great answer for. Uh, comparing the pasture low milk, low producing cow versus the intensely cooled high producing cow. Um, again, because the two are, one's experiencing a different heat load from the environment. And the other one's generating a lot more metabolic heat internally. So it's um, it's an interesting comparison, and I'm not familiar with data that has evaluated the two. Um, so I apologize. Okay. Um, interestingly, um, uh, so next question is, and let's see if we get any any expansion on. Um, so uh, I, I thought I should check this. Um, Jan Baker okay. says pasture cows tend to have higher potassium potassium I always mix those up um, <laughs> intake how would that affect the situation well um, it should probably Thank provide you. some benefit uh, probably provide some benefit because unlike most monogastrics ruminants utilize potassium to sweat so the way an animal sweats is uh, like for you and I we secrete a sodium ion out of our uh, sweat gland and that osmotically pulls water. And that's what you see on your skin is that bead of water. But that bead of water is there because your sweat gland secreted a sodium, sodium ion. <clears throat> Ruminants utilize potassium to do that same thing. Now, they're not great sweaters, ruminants, but you know they're not as bad as a pig, but they're not as good as a horse. Um, so, uh, they have an increase in potassium requirements. So there might be some benefit to that increased potassium that's naturally found in the fresh pasture. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, this is coming back up to a question quite a while ago. Resting yeah. time per day, how many hours are good for milking cows? Was that Ron Solomon's question? Uh, actually, no, it's, um, okay. it oh. is okay. Yep. Nugent, Kan Kong? I, I'm yeah. terrible at that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Resting time per day. How many hours are good for milking cows? Oof. Uh, if they're not eating or m being milked, I guess, the, or drinking, the more resting time, the better. But I'm not a behaviorist. And I don't, Tom, I can't do, you, um, do you have insight on that? 10 to, 10 to 12 hours. All right. 10 Thanks. To 12 hours. Go, go back to uh, some of Rick Grant's webinars on <clears throat> on some of this stuff and, and he goes through this really well yeah and we had one a, a couple couple two three years ago um also if you're using our program there is a resting time calculation in the recipe tools that you can look at and see how much 
potential loss of milk production due to lack of resting time. Um, let's see. Let's go to back to another question. Um, got that one going then. Um, force feeding mice yeah. during bacterial challenges leads to adverse yeah. effects. How do or results? How does the immune system not benefit from increased glucose supply in these situations? That's a great question. That's a really fantastic. Um, it's a really fantastic uh, question. Here's what here's what I and I don't know the answer to you, but here's what I, I will tell you. If you if you force in the in the person who wrote this question is very astute. Um, if you force feed a sick animal, they're likely to become more sick or die. Okay, and this has been shown nicely in rodents. So this loss of appetite during uh, uh, an infection is a strategy to help survive the infection. Okay. If you force feed a heat stress animal, they also die. So that gives me more and more confidence that the immune system is playing an incredibly important role, mediating most of the phenotypic responses during heat stress. Um, so I don't, in other words, I don't think it's a coincidence that if you force feed a heat stress animal, they die. And if you force feed a, a bacteria infected animal, they die as well. Uh, Maynard Horberg did this with uh, gestating sows. They force fed heat stressed gestating sows and they fell over dead. So um, so the, your question about the biology that you would think, right? The animal has this increased requirements for the immune system, glucose and amino acids that an increase in appetite should occur during, when you're sick or during your, when you're heat stress. But you know, clearly that's not, uh, not the case. So, and the biology of which I'm not, I'm not real sure. I, I've read where people think that one strategy of to reduce your appetite when you're sick or heat stress is to reduce the substrates available for uh, GI tract uh, microbes. So if you reduce, if, if you stop eating, um, and if you're sick, you get diarrhea. Actually, some heat stress animals also have diarrhea. Or if you vomit, one that you know, so you stop eating, you vomit, and you have diarrhea. These are all strategies to maximize the removal of a potential pathogen, right? Um, and so you reduce the endotoxin load in the gut. So anyway, it's it's a very interesting question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, I don't have a good answer. You noticing a pattern here? I haven't answered it. <laughs> More research is needed. <laughs> needed at, at Iowa home. State University. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so a final question that I have from Ron, um, is pan he, and this was follow up to some of what we talked about mm -hmm. earlier, um, panting starts about one to one and a half hours post intensive cooling when the conditions in the barn are good, it can go even to one hour when climate conditions right. are bad. So when moderate panting starts around like 80 minutes yeah. is at the beginning of pathological right. issues. I, I, I think so. Right. The, um, panting of course is a way to, she dissipates heat. Um, so in 80 breaths per minute, it's quite a bit, right? Resting breaths is probably around 40, 30 mm -hmm. to 50 would be the range. So when you get up to 80 breaths per minute, she's obviously uh, experiencing a heat load that she can't get rid of. So, um, yeah, if she's at 80 breaths per minute after an hour of your last cooling session, I think she's stressed. She's already stressed again. Okay. All right, that, um, unless I get more questions, I'm going to ask Bill and Tom if you have any closing questions or thoughts, if you're still here. Thanks. I'll hit Lance later. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe tonight. <laughs> That's what I meant. Yeah, perfect. All right. Bill, any thoughts or, or closing comments or questions? Not directly on the topic, but the, the, the bypass glucose work, because there I'm, I'm to, I'll profess total ignorance. I'm good at that. Um, does that glucose actually end up going to drive lactose, or does the cow differentiate that? Uh, origin of glucose from the propionate derived, you know, liver generated glucose. Do you know, Lance? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And one of the things that I've always, you know, I've wondered or been concerned about is if, if the if the small intestine is simply uh, absorbing glucose, does the liver simply make less of it? That's what I mm. was, has kind of been worried about. Or does the small intestine convert most of that absorbed glucose into lactate? Well, that, that's way. what I always thought from reading Chris Reynolds' work and such, you yeah. know, but... Um... Yeah, okay. no, the, the lactate could be used as, as a precursor to gluconeogenesis again, presumably. But so what we've observed with our bypass, bypass glucose experiment was um, not an increase in milk, but a decrease, sorry, no effects on milk. I think that's primarily because the mammary gland has these glucose transporters where the KM is very low. So in other words, even when blood glucose levels are probably clinically hypoglycemic, the, the glucose transporters at the mammary gland are still operating at a maximum level. Um, so I don't think hypoglycemia is ever the cause of a reduction in milk yield. But the increase in uh, the bypass glucose experiment we did, we saw an increase in insulin and mm -hmm. a decrease in NEFAs. So clearly mm -hmm. there's a metabolic response going on with the bypass glucose that is presumably a, a good thing, right? Um, yeah. It just didn't translate into milk in, uh, in our in our experiment. Yeah, I've right. seen others where it has. So excellent. Well, thank you, and, and I'll threaten as Tom did, and I'll be in touch in the future or keep right, in we'll touch. See you tonight. Yeah, yeah Bill, don't hesitate to join tonight. <laughs> I will do my best. All right, all right. Hey, Lance, thank you so much. You missed um, early on. I played Irish music. Um, <laughs> back when the sound was cooperating for me <laughs> so when i got on i saw i had, I had no problems i heard you fantastic uh, i guess i heard myself fantastically and um i didn't have any problems and i got on about 20 minutes before it, it ended yeah i'm not sure i have i usually this is the first time i've done a um webinar from a presentation a powerpoint recording mm. and i can't touch anything on any of my other open screens without pausing the presentation so oh, i'm going to okay. convert it um today during the day okay. into a recording so that i can just run that because i'm i'm in i'm accustomed to being able to answer people or turn up the volume or do whatever and I was stymied and I was mm -hmm. crazy, which isn't hard to have it happen. So oh, and, great. And people were very tolerant. So I appreciate that. I um, saw there was like a, there was like 90 some people. I, a lot of names I recognize from Australia and Europe. And Yeah, no, the morning webinars are we get we get a really broad um, scope of people. It's fantastic. Ah, so we got a question. <laughs> <laughs> tropical breeds can obviously handle heat loads better and i hope tom's still on here is mm -hmm. it because they handle feedstuffs metabolite mm -hmm. metab i can't say that word today mm -hmm. yeah balcony. you know <laughs> i know they're they're thinner hided in relation to breeds like brahmin and lore um but are any research on mm -hmm. how they handle feedstuffs nutritionally are you still here tom is gone shoot because he he talks about the gur cat gur mm -hmm. um yeah, in brazil. in brazil mm -hmm. So, um, well, so the, these tropical breeds do a variety of things different than European breeds. Um, they sweat better for one, they are, they not as, they don't produce as much. So they produce less metabolic heat. Um, they have more surface area because of the floppy ears and, you know, other strategies from the hide to, to dissipate heat. I'm not aware. I'm sure Tom would know. If yeah. they if they digest feeds better, um, they probably have reduced feed intake, and as a consequence, reduced pass passage rate. So there might be more time spent in the GI tract, which would presumably increase digestion. Yeah, and and Bill might be able to wade in here, but if I remember Tom mentioning once. Um, Panting is maybe more effective with some of those breeds. Oh, I can't. I can't I'm, come. Up I think it's something hidden in the model or not hidden, but buried. Lance, yeah. are you? 
I'll get, uh, I'm going to save this question and, yeah. and bring it up this afternoon yeah. um, for Tom to, to see if he has some insight. I know he had another meeting to go to at 1030. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm going to save this one. Um, okay. I'll come back to it. And if whoever asks it either wants to join us tonight or um, just catch it in the recording when it's finally up and I'll do a better job of getting them up faster this time. All right. Awesome. Is everybody good? Very good. Well, thanks again, Lance. Great, great discussion. No problem, guys. Thanks for having me. I appreciate All it. Right. Thanks a bunch, Lance. We'll see you tonight. Bill, thank you. See you tonight, um, guys. Everybody who joined us, thank you so much. And we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Ciao. Before we get started, I'm going to ask Bill. He had some really good questions this morning. And um, as I maybe alluded, I was not the most skilled webinar person this morning. Um, and I didn't get the first few questions recorded. So Bill, if you could um, ask those again so that we have them for posterity. And, and Lance, thanks for joining again this afternoon. No problem. Well, Marianne, I can't remember what I had for lunch, and you're asking me what questions <laughs> I asked. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you can manage. You're wonderful. So I think, Lance, you, one of the questions Eleanor brought up, and I'm probably paraphrasing here, but the strategy of uh, metabolic um, heat stress in terms of diet considerations and um, walking the line you know, between reducing um, forages with a high latent heat of fermentation using more um, fermentable concentrates and such that may give off less heat. And uh, I think she was asking your your opinion on that. And so, um, and maybe you recall exactly what it was, but I think that was the gist of it. So why don't we start with that? Yeah, your memory is um, about equivalent to mine. I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was along those lines of, are there macro nutrients that could be considered um, in the diet and to take advantage or... Yeah, take advantage of of a less heat heat increment of digestion, like fats, and um, so lipids have a low heat of digestion. In other words, in the process of digesting, absorbing, and assimilating uh, different types of lipids, uh, that gives off the least amount of heat compared to protein and carbohydrates. So, but surprisingly, there's not a lot of research that's look that looks at any one of these three macronutrients uh, during heat stress, but Fat's probably the one that has the most. I think there's nine or 10 papers. And about half of them show an improvement with um, in productivity with increasing the levels of dietary fat. Um, fiber generates a lot of heat during fermentation, of course. So the, there's a temptation to reduce the amount of fiber in the diet. And of course, feed intake has gone down. So energy consumption has gone down. So reducing the fiber and throwing more grain into the diet uh, is sometimes an attractive strategy, but I think that needs to be, I think that needs to be decided carefully because for a variety of reasons, the heat stress cow is already prone to acidosis, um, rumen acidosis in particular. So yeah, I, I think it's, it's wise not to just automatically reduce the fiber content of the diet. In fact, if anything, I think you'd want to maintain uh, probably the best forages on the farm save them for the hot summer months and uh, don't give in to that um, urge to reduce the fiber content of the diet during the summer yeah and you know just um corollary a lot of us will use soy hulls or some other highly mm -hmm. digestible source of fiber to keep the ndf levels up yeah. but at the same time have less heat increment of fermentation but there again you got to watch your efficiencies and empty bunk disease and slug feeding. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's all management strategy. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this morning, I know Lance gave a really good shout out, and I just want to say, Bill did an excellent presentation last month on um, management practices mm -hmm. to mitigate heat stress, 
And I really promise you, I'll get those up in the next couple of weeks. I've had a project I'm working on that Mm. has distracted me, but um, those will be available for you. Those of you that didn't attend, it'll be on the website. Yeah, just like... Go Sorry, go ahead, Bill. No, 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 please, please, go ahead. No, I was just, I was just um, re- reiterating something we mentioned this morning, that the, the biggest return on an investment, if you're a producer, if you're a dairy farm producer, the biggest return on investment is almost always the heat stress abatement strategies, right? right? Shade, evaporative cooling, fans, et cetera. Um, once, the, once the producer is invested fully into heat stress abatement, now it makes more sense to start talking about making small changes to the diet, and but uh, you know I, I should maybe I shouldn't say that so so easily because heat stress abatement strategies can be incredibly expensive. There, so a lot of producers might not have the capital to go f- go all in on heat stress abatement, and and thus chose to you know try to manage heat stress with nutritional changes as well. And, um, you know, so I'll segue into the one question I had this morning where um, monitoring performance decline due to heat stress isn't available any longer as a lot of dairies are abandoning um, the data capture technologies of milk weights and such. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're going to go in and try to demonstrate with blood to, to look at the markers of inflammation, you know, I'd ask you, cost and lab analysis availability, you know, which one would you recommend to at least make the case, here's the subclinical damage that you're doing. Now, you know, what is it going to take, you know, for you to recognize that these cows are burning calories to to remain looking healthy when in fact it's robbing your milk production? Um, And I do understand because I have clients where the grid does not allow us to have any more electricity and water what for any of those of us who manage dairies dealing with summer water into the lagoons <laughs> with the soakers on it is is not a joy okay we got all this water to get rid of but that being said the first step is the microclimate of the cow so i'll i'll let you answer the question about the the markers of inflammation in case other yeah. people have the thought yep so similar to our conversation this morning if a if a farmer has daily milk weights and has has the capacity and uh, wherewithal, I guess, to monitor individual cow milk yield, that's probably your best and obviously cheapest uh, marker of of health. High producing cows are healthy, and low producing cows are not. But a lot of farmers don't have that daily milk weights, or they don't have the capacity or the time to chase that down. So then, what's Plan B? And um, there are a variety of um, circulating markers of of inflammation. Some of them are highly variable, like the cytokines, TNF alpha, interleukins. These are um, incredibly variable, so it's difficult, if not impossible, to take a spot sample and get an assessment of inflammation using those type of cytokines. So, we typically use these acute phase proteins that are uh, less variable, um, and they're like, like LPS binding protein, haptoglobin, and serumemoid A. And a negative acute phase protein like albumin. What I mean by negative is that its contribution goes down during um, an infection. So haptoglobin seems to be the one that's probably most often used. It can be measured by most of that uh, PATH labs. Um, And albumin also on most uh, large animal um, panels at PATH labs. So you can kind of get a pretty good assessment None of these are cheap, but um, if you are a consultant and trying to convince your dairy producers that they have a problem that they may or may not be aware of, that could be some, you know, valuable information to show them. And the other question I recall, you mentioned zinc being Mm. uh, possibly protective. And and I asked about whether uh, maintenance of tight junctions, and um, again, for the sake of the the, uh, the home audience, uh, why don't you repeat what, you know, what we talked yeah. about? Let's see. Yeah, well, you know, there's a, so, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about the macronutrients, but there's a variety of micronutrients, in particular, um, some different types of amino acids, methionine, um, betaine, 
<coughs> excuse me, and um, minerals, the trace minerals like zinc. And so the human literature had been evaluating dietary zinc to help with um, a variety of leaky gut pathologies for the last 40 years. We essentially just took a page from their playbook and, and evaluated whether or not it works well on heat stress pigs and dairy cows. And it turns out it does. It does a pretty good job. And how it works isn't real clear yet. It's likely that the heavy metal is upregulating the heat shock proteins, which then help anchor the tight junction proteins on the lateral side of the enterocytes. So like it prevents them from being pulled into the cell. And so the barrier just stays there a little bit longer, a little bit stronger. Um, and so I think, you know, we've looked at a variety of different types of zinc, zinc amino acid complexes, um, Yeah, just it. so I think it's a good strategy. Uh, one more point, and then I'll because it, again, doing diligence to what we talked about, um, the concept of of using uh, modifying the microbiome to reduce challenge, and and possibly, you know, create a microbial terroir effect uh, with bacillus to um, yeah. enhance the tight junction and, and again re reduce the um, penetration uh, of the enterocytes. You know, I think I'd asked that, you know, what your ex experience and thoughts were on that. Well, up until 18 months ago, I had very little experience um, with utilizing a DFM or a bacillus or a yeast products during heat stress. I, I've now since published one on utilizing um, a yeast product during heat stress in dairy cows. It worked pretty well. And um, I've done three projects now with three different types of bacillus and have become a pretty big believer in the, the effects of bacillus. Um, I used to think that pretty much all the mode of action was in the small and large intestine. And <clears throat> this is another example where the monogastric groups, especially the chickens, chicken researchers are way ahead of us on leaky gut and the consequences, but they have been looking at different types of bacillus products at improving gut integrity for a long time. And um, I think it turns out that it's also pretty effective in pigs and dairy cows as well. So there are, I think there are a variety of different types of dietary, dietary strategies. I don't think it's a, a silver bullet. There's probably not going to be one single dietary strategy or a component or a compound or supplement that's going to fix things, but it can be part of a cocktail, right? A part of a, a holistic strategy to help minimize the negative consequences of heat stress. Okay. Well, let me jump oh, no, no, no. in there, though, and ask a question <laughs> related along those lines. Mm -hmm. Are we talking acute heat stress or chronic heat stress? And do you think there's a difference in, you know, is there some adaptation that occurs that might just be a lower level of metabolic rate uh, over over a month's time or whatever, Lance? Yeah. I've, Tom, you're spot on. And this why this is actually why I was a little bit reluctant to uh, try to answer Bill's question about uh, a blood marker of heat stress or inflammatory marker of heat stress because like I used to live in Arizona for 10 years. That's a that's a hundred days, right? 120 days of brutal, pretty brutal heat. And of course we know all all animals re, uh, acclimate or adapt to stress, right? So the 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 inflammatory profile to heat stress in early June or early April, May, would probably be substantially different than it is at the end of August. And the, the, the best lines of evidence to support this uh, acclimation phenomenon is cattle, when cattle die during heat stress or, you know, throughout the United States, it's almost never at the end of the summer, when in fact the heat loads are almost always higher. Right, it's typically June, um, late May, June. A couple of years ago, when the ADSA was in Kansas City, and I guess you remember that, like yeah. fifteen thousand head of fifteen thousand head of beef cattle died in Kansas. Uh, that was early June, right? So that same heat load, or even maybe even more of, a, of an intense heat load at the end of August, would probably would not have killed those cattle because they had acclimated. 
Yeah, good, good point. Very good point. And so, so another uh, here problem here, Tom, is that when we do experiments at the universities, we're almost always looking at relatively acute heat stress loads, seven days, 10 days, maybe 14 days, right? So, you know, to be quite honest with you, we don't, at the university at least, we don't have a good appreciation for how effective these particular products are on a long-term acclimated heat stress critter. Yeah, and, and that, that's that's always a concern I have. And, you know, it, they might be a good, you know, we know that we're going to get, you know, an extreme heat event here in the next 10 days. All right, yeah. what can we do to help alleviate that with the animal? But does that mean that these things need, should be and should we maintain those levels? Because we could be starting to look at some significant cost throughout yes. the entire, the oh, entire yeah. summer. And, and, and that's a question that, that I don't think any of us can answer because we don't have the data to, to, to be able to say yes or no. Yes. Uh, but, it, but it is, I think, you know, what we need to come back to. And I, I loved when you said this this morning, Lance, that at the end of the day, and you just said it now, there is no silver bullet. There's no magic bullet. And mm -hmm. really, the first thing that we need to get people to focus on is cooling the damn cow. And, and, yeah. and you know, let's not be chasing expensive additives and such to put a Band-Aid on something that, that a good investment in true cooling systems can help us a significant amount. Uh, I'll, I'll even go one step further, uh, Tom, and especially relevant to our listeners this morning and this afternoon. I don't think it's clear what happens to maintenance costs during heat stress. I know uh, you have a classic paper with Danny, um, you know, where you mentioned that there's an increase in maintenance costs. And it's this is mentioned by the godfathers of metabolism, right? Baldwin mentions it. Yep. Um, and, but, and I think it's, I think this increase in maintenance costs is built in this, into the models, right? It is. Okay, but what if it wasn't increased? In fact, not only what what if it wasn't increased, what if it actually decreased? And what would the implications be to then, a, you know, balancing ration? Well, or is it a, uh, is it partially right for the wrong reasons? Hmm. Uh, you know, going back to your parafed studies, I love those studies. Yeah. You know, we had that reduction in, in efficiency, that change in metabolism, where intake's only accounting for 35 to 55% of the drop in milk. Is yeah. that shift in metabolism? Are we calling that an increase in maintenance when it's really the, 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 the KL actually drops? Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But, it, but, it, but that's how I've been thinking about it in, yeah. in, in the, recently. I've I've tried to convince the USDA two years in a row now to fund some experiments for with Paul Kononoff and I on accurately measuring maintenance cost of heat stress cows. And they just simply do not think it's an important problem, even though despite the fact that Paul uh, has done a great job of quantifying economically, what if heat stress actually decreases maintenance costs and then the implications to like uh, practicing nutritionists? Right. Um, you got to you got to tie you got to tie in the potential for for shifts in methane emissions and turf methane emissions. Yeah, exactly. That. That's the only thing I want to fund at the moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so I have to. Yes, mom. <laughs> yeah, you guys can. We'll come back to this talk, but um, okay. poor Paula is sitting down in hot, hot Argentina, oh. and she has a bunch of questions. So yeah, with a beer with a beer in one hand and a glass of wine in the other. So let's hope her mic works this time. Paula, go. Hi. Good. How are you? <laughs> Good. Thank you. Tom. Which, which I... Yes. You shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> because it's true. <laughs> Hi, Lance. How are you? Hi, Paula. I'm doing well. I hope you have some cerveza and provoletta. Uh, on your plate at the moment? No, I'm not. I, I have mate with me. Yeah. Uh, I I love Malbec and, and Provoletta. It's my, I could eat, 
that for an entire meal. Ah, okay. Good to know. So, <laughs> Lance, uh, great, uh, great presentation. It was very, very interesting. There are many questions here. Uh, the, okay. the first two ones, I think you, you've already talked about them. So, I will go to the sec uh, third one. Uh, is heat stress related to hemorrhagic gut syndrome? Mm. Um, I think there is some seasonality to HBS, but, you know, I, I know of cases of HBS that occur in January. So um, if there is a connection, it's probably just a correlation and not a cause and effect. Okay, perfect. The next question, is it possible to limit or avoid the gut inflammatory cascade? Mm. Uh, well, I, I, th I think so. And one of the things I did not talk a lot about today is the um, es escaping of starch during heat stress. You know, the heat stress cow will double, almost double their intake of water. So soluble um, a passage rate goes goes up um and there's an increased risk of rumen acidosis during uh heat stress so then that increases the starch bypassing of the rumen as well and we talked about this this morning a little bit so i think the main thing to try to avoid gut induced inflammation is modifying the environment preventing from preventing them from getting hot in the first place and balancing the ration properly to get it maximizing the digestion in the rumen. And then there's, of course, supplements that you could potentially utilize to minimize the uh, inflammation that comes from the gut. Okay, perfect. Marian, I have two more questions. Paul, why don't uh, you keep going since um, we waited so okay. long to let it you Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, next question is, uh, could exogenous glutamine help to control heat stress? Exogenous glucagon? Glutamine. Oh, glutamine. Sorry. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, so glutamine... Um, is one of those amino acids that have been looked at for improving gut health um, in, in, extensively in the rodent and human literature. And um, I think there's a lot of promise with those function, you know, biologically functioning amino acids. In other words, they have a, they have a role other than just simply their incorporation into proteins. Citrulline is another one. I think citrulline has a lot of promise at improving gut health. Um, but citrulline is very expensive. I'm not, I don't know what the cost of our of, of glutamine is, but yeah, I, I I've seen quite a few papers. I've not done research with it, but I've seen quite a few papers that have evaluated glutamine's impact at minimizing gut inflammation. Okay, great. And the last one, uh, could the addition of bicarb help with acidosis? I, th I think so, especially if it's cheap. Um, I, I remember when I was living in Arizona and you talk to these practicing nutritionists who are very successful, you know, they'll, they'll up the bicarb up to 350, 400 grams during the summertime. As an academic, we could argue about how important that is. Right, because the cow is making, I don't know, two thousand grams of, uh, or not maybe not two thousand grams. But I can't remember how much the cow is making itself, but it's a lot. So, uh, you know, an academic skeptic might say, "Well, if you add a couple hundred grams, that's nothing to the total bicarb load." But if it's cheap, um, I think it's probably a pretty safe strategy, and it's pretty common. Uh, let, let me let me throw it around a different way. No, yeah. um, I don't consider it a rumen buffer, but how about a metabolic buffer? You know, bring mm. the, driving decat up and really going after, especially with increased respiration rate. She's blowing yeah. how much buffer out, and are we just recharging 
the the metabolic buffering system with with sodium and then potassium. Yeah, that's very likely, right? So what what Tom's uh, referring to is the hyperventilation that occurs essentially cause causes a metabolic acidosis. Right. Um, actually, it's a metabolic alkalosis at first, and then then acidosis afterwards. But um, yeah, that that could very well be. Paula, do you want to go ahead with your other question? Yes, please. Uh, is, is there any relationship between heat stress length and milk yield recovery? How much mm. do we have to wait until uh, the health issues uh, mm -hmm. get uh, good okay, uh, again yeah. and milk production uh, gets uh, where it was before the heat stress? Yeah. Well, I, there's a couple of things I want to point out here, Paula, in that I think that the primary answer to your question is related to stage of lactation. So if she's early lactation, she'll she'll try to keep, you know, she'll have, she'll keep the pedal to the metal on milk yield. And so, you know, she may bounce back. But if she's, you know, if she's 250, 275 days in milk and she gets hit hard by heat stress, she may just give up, right? Um, but remember also, it's not just milk that costs us money. And to give you a little appreciation for how much reproduction is affected by uh, heat stress. I, I live in Iowa, a pretty Northern climate. It's about on latitude wise, the same as Pennsylvania and Southern New York. Um, anyway, you know, it's not unusual for a dairy farms preg rate in January, February to be pushing 30%. And that preg rate dropped down to 15, 12% at the end of August. And then as soon as September comes and we're out playing football and the weather is perfect, right? Milk yield yeah, will come back. But repro preg rate won't come back until probably December, end of December. So my, I guess my point of that um, story is that the lingering effects of heat stress on repro is much more severe than the lingering effects of heat stress on milk. And that probably costs the producer as much, if not more. Okay. Paula, did you have one more after that? Or I've got one. Yes. That... Okay, go mm -hmm. ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you consider using bypass fat to compensate for the energy loss in low starch yeah. diets? Um, yeah, I, I was kind of mentioning that earlier. I, I remember this was pushed in maybe five years ago now. I got asked by one of these regional meetings, like, I don't know, like maybe the Southwest Nutrition Conference or Forest State Nutrition Conference to give a talk on fat during heat stress. And so I went into that literature assuming that I would find dozens, if not a hundred research papers, because the dogma is so strong in all of our animal industries, not just dairy. It's, it's strong in poultry and in and beef and in pig nutrition as well. The dogma, of course, is that you need to increase the fat content of, of the diet during the summertime because it has a low heat increment of, of digestion. I could find nine papers, and I think we scoured the internet pretty hard. Uh, there may be a couple more since then, but oh, when I found those nine papers, five of them demonstrated uh, a measurable benefit. So, you know, more than 50%. And so I think the dogma is probably a dogma for a reason, because it's probably true. Um, increasing the dietary levels of fat can help maintain productivity during the summertime. Okay, okay. thank you very much. And Paula, if you get more no. questions, um, let me know. I'm going to yes. ask one. We had a lot more discussion this morning about um, some of the adaptations that tropical breeds will have to handle heat stress. Had a question that we didn't get to. Um, Lance, you sort of said, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know about that, but maybe Tom does. So, and mm -hmm. he had left the room. So this is from um, this morning. Uh, tropical breeds can obviously handle heat loads better. Is is this because of how they handle feedstuffs metabol 
metabolically, um, he knows this person knows they're thinner hided in relation to breeds like Brahmin and Nalore. Um, but any research on how they handle feedstuffs nutritionally. And I think we deferred that one to Tom. Okay, I'll do that. Um, actually, the, the work I know that's out there, you know, there's, there's no differences in efficiencies. I, I can't think of much or any calorimetry data, uh, but, but just using calculations, uh, if there's any differences, they'd be really, really small. I, it's more they can handle heat load better because they have a hell of a lot more surface area, a lot more skin. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at these tropical breeds, you'll see folds of skin in their front end, uh, their, their neck skin, their dewlap. There's a hell of a lot more there. And they've got a hell of a lot bigger ears. And the amount of heat, if you look at thermal imaging, the amount of heat that, that cows will lose through their ears is pretty phenomenal. So it's really their their adaptation is due to uh, their evolution in terms of, of body body type and and surface area. Interesting. Yeah, and and they, and because they're not producing typically, they're not producing as much um, uh, milk. Their the basal heat production is less. I, I, I was going to say that, Lance, but then I was thinking about some GER herds I know in Brazil that are, you know, averaging 38, 39, 40 liters. So yeah. it, it, it's, uh, but they still see a really good response when they get those cows in cooling situate systems. Mm, interesting. And Tom, I think you mentioned um, in, in our last couple of webinars, the possibilities of introducing some of those GER genetics or um, tropical breed genetics into herds in the United States where there's- Well, it, for, for heat stress situations, I, I think that that is something that needs to be investigated. I mean, they do have a unique personality as in they're mean, mean as hell. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think it also- I'm, I'm going to throw this out there, and, and it, I know it'll be controversial, uh, but I don't care. Um, I think as we look around the world, and with heat stress, uh, with, with environmental conditions, not to mention forage availability and like that, I think we really need to look at, as, as a global industry, should there be dairy cows in some of these areas? Uh, from an animal welfare standpoint, we can't manage these girls and keep them in a thermal neutral environment. And that's a, that's a problem. Yep. Yeah, especially when, if they have limited water opportunities or little, uh, small water availability. Oh, yeah. Hey, can I add something, guys? Yeah, go sure. sure. Please. So, and again, this is probably from the Journal of Duh, but I'll, at the risk of sounding like that, I'll say it. Um, when we talk about dry matter intake suppression from heat stress, aside from the markers of inflammation, you know, which are well documented um, to cause an anorectic state, you know, we touched upon the fact that these girls become marginally as metabolically acidotic, right? And so we know that when we put a dry cow through a negative decad program, we're creating a low level of metabolic acidosis to affect the, the, the calcium, ultimately the calcium mobilization. Um, and so I think we have to recognize that feeding of the buffers um, is important for the, the total decad picture as impacts the blood because I think that is one of the real benefits that we see when we get sodium potassium up there um, to help offset some of those metabolic issues um, that would also be suppressing intake. Or am I wrong? No. No, well, I, I don't think you're wrong. I, and I think that's why, you know, the... the Especially given when we think outside of the U.S., even within the U.S., but we're a little bit better. Um, 
the complete lack of routine wet chem or XRF mineral analysis. Right. And we look at a lot of these diets, you know, we get into some of these areas that are really, really high maize silage. Maize silage is their primary forage. We're going to be low in sodium. We're going to be low in potassium. And are we, are we really running these cows at higher production levels in mild metabolic acidosis on a regular basis? And when we think about the whole chain of events, you know, I love that question about how long does it take for the cow to recover? How long should we expect? And I'm going to say on some of these cows, when we add up all of these insults, uh, we're probably two years. If, if everything went to being perfect, we're probably two, two full lactation cycles to get them back to where they really should be. And, and I, I think that that is a, pr a problem I have with, with the way a lot of people think. They, they only think about how are we going to impact something today when some of these events, some of these insults take a very, very long time to actually do full recovery. And, and I don't think we know the answer to, to how long these some of these things take for the cow to actually return to a quote unquote normal cow so tom given um our next month's discussion with the effects of heat stress in utero would it be arguable that those animals that are experiencing heat stress repeatedly um are probably out of dams that were in the same mm -hmm. situation so do they ever get to their potential no they don't I don't think they ever do. And I think that that is, you know, when we look at the variability, you know, similar type diets, similar type genetics in different parts of the world, different parts of the country, we can just go in the US and look at the, the some of the extreme differences we see in, in milk production. This and, is why. Yeah. Well, and, and to extend it on because everything is related and it's not a simple solution. That brings back that question that you just posed. Are there places where there shouldn't be dairy cows? Because <laughs> if the solution to methane emissions is efficiency. Absolutely, Marianne. <laughs> Very complex. Oh, Paula. Very controversial. Yes. Yeah, because we're all, you know, you should be able to do what you want to do. But yeah. Paula, have you have questions? Yes, I have two more. Okay. The, the first <laughs> one is, <laughs> uh, do you think, oh, wait, minute. Uh, is it a viable strategy to transfer embryos to increase mm -hmm. pregnancy rate during summertime? Well, you're far from my uh, area of expertise, but I've read papers specifically from Pete Hansen's group. He's a professor at the University of Florida where they've essentially eliminated or markedly reduced the negative consequences on, on preg rates by using doing that exact strategy where they mature the embryos in the laboratory um, until they get at past like the 10th day stage or something like that and then implant them. And then... Um, that embryo is more likely to survive the heat stress. The other, the yeah, other cool one, the other cool hmm. one, I don't remember who did this, but they, there was a study where they did, they, it was the same cows, I think, they collected uh, embryos from heat stress cows and from cows not under heat stress and implanted the heat stress embryos in non-heat stress cows. Hmm. And it was a good crossover design. And, and the preg rate and the, the um, oh God, did they follow through? They followed through on production, I think, too. The embryos that were from the non heat stress cows had, there were higher preg rates, higher everything with those versus the heat stress embryos. So it, I think that's an interesting, it's an interesting thought to, to uh, uh, dig more into in terms of repro is could we collect a bunch of embryos on, from non-heat stress times 
and then use those uh, during heat stress. That 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 would be an interesting management uh, discussion. Yes. Okay, perfect. And the last one, do you think the mycotoxin level in milk increases when leaky gut is an issue? And what about liver oxidative stress? Mm. Those are good questions. Yeah, they are good questions. I think <laughs> the contaminants in milk, no matter what they are, is probably going to go up during leaky gut or during heat stress. Most of the most blood leaving the GI tract will go through the liver first. So if the liver is functional, um, it will probably filter a great amount of that. Uh, it's a great question. I just don't know the answer. Um, so I'm just speculating that the answer is yes, that there'll be more mycotoxin transfer from the gut to the milk during during the summer. And certainly there's oxidative stress during heat stress um, at the gut. And I think there's data demonstrating that it occurs at the liver as well. There's probably oxidative stress everywhere, actually, during heat stress event, acute heat stress especially. Um, okay. Yeah, that's my. Yep. Two more. Paula has two more. <laughs> that's another good researchable area for yeah. Iowa State. <laughs> at, at Iowa State University. I was waiting for that plug. <laughs> Go ahead, Paula. Okay. Uh, this question is from Victor. Uh, going back to the uh, repro issue, would you recommend to delay the service in in heifers four to six months to avoid uh, deliveries during uh, to avoid uh, mm. milk peaks? Sorry, during yeah. the the hottest months. Mm. Well, that's you know, a management decision. But then you might not be calving a heifer out until she's 30 months old. Yeah. Mm. That's another problem. And, and her total yeah. lifetime production will be lower. Uh, yeah. not, to, not to mention higher rearing costs, higher feed costs. Ah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think the best strategy is to calve them out at a, an appropriate time and just cool them with evaporative cooling and and uh, heat stress abatement. Okay. And the last one, um, how does niacin affect the thermoregulatory mechanisms of the cow? Mm -hmm. So niacin is an interesting compound because it has many, uh, it does many things, but one of the things it does is help vasodilation. So when I was at Arizona, Bob Collier and I and Todd Bilby collaborated on some projects where we fed niacin and saw a decrease in body temperature. Um, and I think we did two experiments. And in one experiment, we saw a decrease in body temperature. So, um, you know, I think the, the possibilities there for niacin to be a part of that nutritional strategy to help maintain a safe body temperature during heat stress. I don't know how much it costs. I have no idea. But How many grams did it take, Lance? Oh, I, man, I was thinking nine. But was it, was it protected niacin, Lance, or was it just straight niacin? Because that's the other issue. How much? Yeah. You know, we're pushing like 15 years ago now. Uh, Come on, I didn't, I didn't have my lunch. No, you can do that. Come on, let's go. Um, you're really testing my memory here. I I do remember at first thinking it had to be rumen protected. And then you have to ask the ball cam guys. Uh, I think there was some, there's some thought process maybe that you didn't need to protect it. I can't remember. I, th I can't remember now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I have no more questions. 
<laughs> so, Gracias, yeah. Bella. can we have a corollary to that? If if I do, if I use niacin and divert the blood to the skin, am I compromising circulation to the enterocytes? <laughs> That's a very astute question and one that uh, we internally talked about all the time, right? Because I'm not, I don't think uh, niacin's effects on vasodilation is, is, is targeted to the periphery. So, you know, so during heat stress, the idea is you want uh, um, a coordinated vasoconstriction to get heat to the periphery. Uh, so the periphery is already quite vasodilated. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really understand the biology of how that all works. Okay, I was I'm wondering about it, but I I, yeah. I don't no so am I. I. I don't feed niacin so um, because of the cost. I, I'm not sure. I maybe I should. Okay, but I I don't. So yeah. can I? Can I throw out one more thing? Just if we're talking about the embryos, and I think the work that I, I trained under Peter Elsden, and I, I do believe that you know um, we can avoid the impact of heat stress on uh, breathing by, in fact, doing a tra embryo transfer in those heat stress times. But the other thing that we haven't really discussed during heat stress is um, the possible benefits of some of the essential fatty acids and being protective. Um, you know, omega-6, 18-2, you know, is shown to increase interferon tau, um, both in embryo and, and um, maternal side, which is needed for maternal recognition of pregnancy. And so I'm often wondering under heat stress conditions, are there other aberrations, you know, of the diet or of metabolism that maybe are shorting some of the things that are essential. And all of a sudden we have a, a virtual deficiency in the face, you know, of resources being diverted used for something else. And, and again, I have no science behind that, but it just makes me wonder, you know, we talk about this. So yeah, um, I can are you, I can totally I can totally buy that. I I I, I got squirreled. Uh, into thinking about how could we possibly do some of these things, you know, increase 18.2 and, and, you know, maybe niacin or, or, you know, some other additives. How much could we do by adding these to the drinking water? Mm. Mm. Yeah, because 18, feed intake goes down, water intake goes up. Yeah. Sounds like a study at Iowa State <laughs> University. <laughs> you know, the pig industry and the poultry industry utilizes water medication, water medications all the time. Yep. Yeah. I'm yeah. wondered why I've always wondered why we don't. Actually, overseas in Italy and other countries, there's quite a bit of propylene glycol that is mm. administered through the water. Okay. And um Certainly in the fresh cow pens, you know, whether it's that it should or shouldn't be, it's one of these dogmas, to use your term, Lance, where people have gotten convinced they need it, even after you eliminate the root cause of the problem. But yeah. um, that's just how it is. But I, I know it's effective. Um, you know, the cows are, are drinking the water and they're getting the dose of, of the glycol. Um, and, you know, whether they need it or not, now it's just an expense. But, yeah. So it, it is, and certainly there are minerals that are being delivered that way. But yeah. as long as the palatability, yes. as long as the palatability isn't impacted, you know. So, yeah. but most of our large farms, the, the water systems that are are, it would be a disaster to try to do it through a central location. Yep. Yeah. It would be almost impossible. You know, hence hence the advent of the micro machine, right? Because that's yeah. the that, that's the solution. Yeah. Anyway, okay. I wish we could go have a beer and continue the conversation, guys. This is great. I know great. this has been great. Thanks, thanks everybody for showing up, and Bill and Tom and Lance and Paula, um, Lynn and I have been listening and hopefully learning. But <laughs> um, this has been great, and um, it's it's been wonderful to just hear you guys bat and things back and forth. Um, 
Any other questions before I let everybody go have a beer? No, <laughs> let me just make a comment to Paula. Paula, I will reply to your WhatsApp or email Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone. I was, uh, I really enjoyed myself and I appreciate the invitation. Thank you. Thanks, Lance. <laughs> Thanks, Lance. You Thanks, Lance. You bet. See you, okay. Lynn. Bye, everybody. Bye. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. I am delighted to co host this series with Dr. Paula Torillo from Afina in Argentina and Dr. Bill Prokop from Dairy Innovations. We also share hosting honors with several of our AMTS distributors. Dr. Marty Traxler of LaTeX, distributor in Mexico. Dr. Elena Bonfante of Dairy Innovations Italia, our Italian distributor. Dr. Sean Lee of AnsiTech, AMTS distributor in China. And Dr. Marcelo Hens Ramos of 3R Lab and AMTS distributor in Brazil. I am also joined by my colleagues, Lynn Gilbert and Tom Tuluki of AMTS. We wish to thank our wonderful sponsors who allow us to pay our speakers and help justify our time commitment to this project. We thank our gold sponsors, Arm & Hammer Animal and Food Production, hashtag Science Hearted, the Canola Council of Canada, Discover the amazing value of canola meal at canolamazing.com. Adina, experts in animal nutrition with expertise in plant bioactives. And Protetka, transforming the future of farm animal health. Our silver sponsors this year are the Forage Analysis Labs of Dairyland Laboratory with affiliates around the world and Adiseo Ruminant Nutrition Solutions to ensure animal performance. Our bronze sponsors are Amino Max, Virtus Nutrition, Balchem, The Milk Group, and Barron's. Each of these companies support education and research worldwide. We hope you consider them in your formulation decisions. Thank you so much for joining us to listen to this recorded webinar, and we hope to see you in our next webinar.